today we're going to be talking about kintsugi. Now, kintsugi, also known as kintsukuroi, means in Japanese gold, kin, and mend. The speaker today is Bonnie Kemske, who's a professional writer and critic, as well as a ceramic artist with a PhD from the Royal College of Art. She was the editor of Ceramic Review from 2010 to 2013. She was born in Okinawa, raised in the United States. After university, she traveled to Kyoto to study Chanayu, the Japanese tea ceremony. And Bonnie currently lives and works in Cambridge in the UK. In 2017, she published her first book, The Tea Ball, East and West. And that's the first time I discovered her work and her writing. That book, The Tea Ball, presents the story of the iconic Japanese tea ball from her perspective as a ceramicist and a tea student, and its appropriation into contemporary ceramics. Her second book, Kintsugi, The Poetic Mend, is this beautiful volume, which will be published later this month, on February 18th in the UK, and from March 21st onwards on the rest, uh, in the rest of the world. So let's welcome, and let's pretend we can hear your applause, Bonnie Kemske. So lovely to be here. Thank you, John. Uh, well, well, it's a pleasure. When when I first heard that you were um, working on a book about kintsugi, um, I heard from from your publisher. Um, I got curious first because I, I have an interest in Japanese craftsmanship um, and, and arts and, and crafts in general, but also because I have a couple of bowls um, that require repair. So I thought this was a great opportunity to learn more about it. So in fact, let's kick it off by saying what kit Kintsugi, or explaining what Kintsugi is, because there's a lot of misunderstanding out there. There is. There is a lot of misunderstanding. <clears throat> Excuse me. Kintsugi is a Japanese, specifically Japanese, repair technique. It's used mostly for ceramics, but it can be used for other materials as well. It is not a ceramic technique. It is actually a lacquer technique. So the lacquer is used, which is called urushi, and it's Japanese lacquer. It only comes from that part of the world. It's it, lacquer from Europe and things is, is a different kind of lacquer. It doesn't do the same thing. It's used both as a glue to put the pieces back together and to fill the cracks and missing places. And then also to put the gold on top of it as decoration and sometimes and usually to seal the metal, the precious metal as well. Let's let's address this thing, right? Because often people say, oh yeah, kintsugi, repairing with gold, as if gold was somehow fused and used between the cracks. Actually, usually it's gold powder. And as you were mentioning, it's put on top of the lacquer as a finishing, but it's not the agent that's binding things together. That's absolutely right. I mean, I and I was the same as everyone else. When I it looks like solid gold. So I don't know if you can see. Can you see in there? Yes. There's a yep. there's a repair there. There you've got it. That it looks like it's just gold all the way through, but it isn't. It's it's lacquer, and then the the reason then the gold powders, various forms of powder, are sprinkled on top. So there are lots of different kinds of gold you can get, and those give you different qualities as well. So you can get, uh, for instance, one of the cheaper ones is gold leaf that's been ground up, and that gives you a slightly bright and almost a glittery appearance. Whereas if you go for the most expensive, which were little balls, little precious little tiny gold balls, it takes much more skill to use it, but it gives you a deeper and more lustrous gold. Mm. So it's not all the same by any means. Yeah, and also you can, you can use different materials, right? So it's, it's, it's true that the word kin gold is included in, in, yeah. in the name of this technique, but this ginsugi using silver, and, and we might show an example later, but also some people with, with not uh, many uh, resources use glass or, or less noble metals too. Yeah, it, it, you, it, if anyone's going to take this on themselves, they should be careful because gold is inert and it's safe to use. Silver is okay to use, but there are other materials that are not food safe. So do keep that in mind if you decide to do this. Like a lot of people use brass because it looks like gold, but it's not food safe. Mm. So yeah, kintsugi is the umbrella term. And it's not only for 
the lack of repair with precious metals, it actually is often referred to, it often refers to uh, pieces that have been put back together just using the lacquer. So you can use colored lacquer on the top, for instance, you can finish the seam in red lacquer, or now there are, you can buy lots of different colors of, of lacquer, they're pigmented. But the most traditional are red lacquer and black lacquer, which, which date back to Jomon days. So they're millennia old. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the earliest kind of, <clears throat> of, of lacquers used actually are quite toxic until it's cured, right? So, you know, you have to wear gloves and, and, <sighs> and not it, breathe into it. it. It It's something like, now don't quote me on this, but I think it's 90% of the world has an allergic reaction to the ulushi. And I know, for instance, one kintsugi shi, which is a person who does kintsugi, who was hospitalized twice in the first year that she was in business. Mm -hmm. I know someone else who is repeatedly having to take steroids to keep it down. So it's related to poison sumac. It is, it, it is, it can be a very nasty thing. And in Japan, they told me it takes 10 years to get over it. But uh, you know, that's the magic number. Ta everything mm. takes 10 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Long enough that you might forget, you know. It's a... That's right. So, but but then there are some people, and when you see them, like if you look in my book, I have some couple spreads of how-to, and there, the man doing that demonstration is not wearing gloves. And the reason is because he simply doesn't have an allergic re reaction, but most people do. So be careful. Mask, gloves. If you get a bit of a reaction, stop, don't continue. Wait till it settles down before you go back. Mask, gloves, everything. Yeah. So we we've given the the self and safety advice and and, and yes. safety <laughs> advice. Um, but of course, you also mentioned that there's been, you know, different developments from the Kintsugi point of view in, in the materials. First yes. using lacquer, but which is less toxic, but also over the last few years we've seen kits that don't use lacquer, that use, you know, epoxy resin. So there's a lot of things that today get called kintsugi. Yes. I mean, I think that there are two forms of kintsugi. One is traditional, quote, proper kintsugi. And the second is in Japan, they call it kani kintsugi or easy kintsugi. Here, I think we'd call it faux kintsugi. Hmm. And that's just everything else. <laughs> so anyway, you can even buy sort of glittery glues. Mm. to stick things together. I mean, in a very wide understanding of Kintsugi, those things fall into it. But it is a very different thing from the incredibly delicate and skilled art form of proper Kintsugi, which comes from another field. Do you want to talk about Makie? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's mention that because I, I didn't know about that. Yeah, so Kintsugi is not a thing, has never been a, until now has never been a thing unto itself. It's never been a discipline unto itself. It came out of the field of makie, which means sprinkled picture. And the makie, the, the, um, that's how the, the picture was done, is you would take an urushi, so a lacquered piece, you would paint your urushi, another layer of urushi on it, and you would sprinkle gold on it or silver or whatever, and it would stick to where the lacquer was. Mm. So it was traditionally the makie shi, the people doing makie, who did kintsugi repairs. And the kintsugi repairs would really have been their bread and butter money. It was not, it's nothing that they would have particularly advertised you know, they 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 would maybe have become well known for being good at it or whatever. But in general, it was not. They didn't claim it wasn't attributable. This kind of work that you see on the screen, that was attributable. We know who made those, because it was an art form or an artisan form that was very highly valued. But kintsugi, even when we saw the most precious kintsugi bowls in Japan. When we asked the curators, they couldn't tell us who had done the repairs or when. Mm. Not at all. It's completely unattributable. It's it's fascinating because, as you mentioned, these days you do have uh, kintsugi shi, kintsugi artists, mm. or kintsugi craftspeople. But in the past, it, it was 
um, an extension of another activity, another art, uh, another craft. That's right. And it's only recently that in Japan you could go and learn kintsugi, because before you only could go and learn makie, and then you would be able to do kintsugi because you knew how to do makie. <laughs> Now, before we, we get into, into the rabbit hole of, of Kintsugi, and we have you know plenty of photos and stuff, um, why did you write this book? What, what was the urge behind, um, behind it? The question actually is twofold. You're asking, why Kintsugi? And then why did I write a book about it? Mm. So first, I think that Kintsugi, I've, I've known about Kintsugi for a long time but I didn't pay attention to it until I it was about 2013, I think. I was interviewed about it for a, a Radio 4, BBC Radio 4 program called Something Understood. And I began, when I did that interview, it made me really begin to realize how important this Kintsugi concept and its manifestation of a repaired bowl, for instance, in the tea room, was to me and I just became entranced with the subject. And that's always for me the starting point for writing. It's because I want to know all about it. I want to research it. I can't live without it. I'm I just dive into it. Now when why did I write the book? <laughs> well the writing of the book is is it's always for me I hate to use the cliche, but it's a journey. It's important. It's really wonderful to have a book finished and published. That's great. But for me, it's it's really about the journey. The finishing is the extra bit. That's the opening the kiln and you see mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the piece is what you expected it to be or isn't. You know? And yeah, so for me, and the other thing I have to say is that even after you've finished writing a book, you get that really powerful sense of how wonderful it is to have finished something. But at the same time, you know it's never finished because mm -hmm. you're always going to learn more and heaven forbid discover there are mistakes in the book. <laughs> There's a mistake in the T-Bowl book, which I will want to talk about today about Kintsugi. Because <laughs> oh, <fantastic>. <laughs> I um, feel a very desperate need to correct that. <laughs> as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, about 10 years ago, Kintsugi started to become quite popular <laughs> in the West. Outside of uh, if you wish, the ceramic world or, or you know, the the, the proper mm. repair world. Uh, my hunch is that um, our visual culture, you know, the rise of platforms like Instagram helped in that because, as I, as I said, a lot of people focus on the gold side of things and gold is, you know, can be nice and shiny and these objects um, can have a beautiful appearance. Mm. But, it, but this one of the things I love from, from the book is that you get beyond the, the the artistic value of them, also the metaphoric one of Kintsugi. You know, there's a saying um, in, in Japanese, which everything with a shape breaks. Um, and um, especially 2020 was um, a year that broke a lot of things. So I wonder, why do you think that in this last 10 years, Kintsugi has become such a mainstream, uh, mainstream pop culture um, thing or, or concept? Yeah. Uh I mean, there's several reasons, and there are two levels. There is the metaphor, because kintsugi is used as a metaphor with no relationship to actually repairing pots. Mm -hmm. You know, if you Google kintsugi, especially on the American websites, and I'm allowed to say this because I'm American, uh, it is overrun with pop psychology and spiritualism about Kintsugi well-being and Kintsugi spiritual quest and live a Kintsugi life. And, and uh, some of those books are really awful in that there's so much misinformation in them. So take them with a grain of salt. But they, but they, they have, if you will, glommed on to a metaphor that is so striking and so strong. And that's that you can take an object or something that's broken, that's damaged, and you can put it back together. And instead of making it as good as new, you actually mark those scars. You do not, I have to, this is my opinion, but you do not celebrate those scars, but you mark those scars and you end up with something that can be more beautiful and stronger and even more valuable. So the metaphor for life is just overwhelmingly strong. 
So I think that that's part of the reason that it took off here while it fell on fertile ground. But then there's also the actual material kintsugi thing, which is now being done all over the world. And that's because we had already begun to look for things that weren't perfect anymore. We wanted to, we wanted to experience things that were, weren't perfect. We were tired of that life where we were trying to make everything so tightly hmm. acquired and just ordered. And, and it's about accepting the imperfect. So I think that, and also we have, of course, the make, do, and mend culture and the sloppy cult, sloppy craft, which gives us permission to have a go ourselves with, you know, Kani Kintsugi or easy Kintsugi. Uh, so I think that in that sense, that that is quite strong. It, but I think as well, there is, as there's a woman, a philosopher in America called Elizabeth Spellman, who wrote a great book called Repair, Reconstructing in a Fragile World or something like that. If you look up a Elizabeth Spellman, and she says that the drive to repair is universal. And I think that we have lived in a culture that's been a throwaway culture, but we haven't lost that drive. And so suddenly we find a way that we can absolutely embrace that drive to repair. She calls us homo repairans. Mm. <laughs> so, and, and I think that also contributed to our, to Kintsugi's appeal. Yeah, I also have to say that the way Kintsugi is viewed outside of Japan and in Japan is slightly different, I think. I know one Japanese person who kept saying to me when I was doing the research, but it's only a repair. It's mm. nothing but a repair. And then I met other Japanese people who said, oh, no, 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 it's very important. But then they wouldn't articulate. They would only give examples. So they wouldn't say it's about overcoming tragedy and da -da, what we do. They just in their in, you know, in the classic and rather stereotypical way that I'm doing here. Sorry to make generalizations, but they they have accepted it on a metaphoric level without having to articulate it. Right. Um, I just wanted to mention people in the chat are adding the the name of the book and links to it. So so go and check it out. Um, and also, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A uh, section of of Zoom. So um, someone was asking, how do you spell uh, the easy kintsugi uh, and, and the kind of the fake kintsugi? That Kani kintsugi in English is usually spelled K A N apostrophe I hmm. because it's Kan. E, not ka ni, mm. uh, and you can. You, there's not a lot. If you go to search for that, you won't come up with a lot. Um, well, that's a great excuse to, to get your book yeah. uh, <laughs> and get more details into it. No, the, there was. Um, I wanted to to reference the metaphor before we go back to to uh, the actual practice of kintsugi. There's another quote you bring up from Ernest Hemingway: uh, "The world breaks everyone, and afterward, many are strong at the broken places." One of the things I, I like of Kintsugi, beyond the pure aesthetics of it, is that it doesn't hide the story, what went into it. Actually, it becomes more interesting in a way. And, and you do mention that it's important when, when someone is uh, approaching a repair to also not try to change the nature or the personality of the object. Uh, it's not a matter of, of hiding or transforming, but evolving in a way, right? I think so. Although, of course, once you're doing once Kintsugi has left its traditional world, anything goes. And mm -hmm. if your goal is to make it something completely different, then okay, you have permission to do that because we have permission to do anything. But the best traditional Kintsugi pieces do augment and add to the original piece. They don't overwhelm it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you remember in the book, there was a story that my friend Alex Frazier told about being in Japan studying tea. And he and his tea students were at a museum and with their teacher. And they, one of the students spotted a tea bowl with beautiful kintsugi repair on it. And the students all one by one came closer and closer to the showcase to see this tea bowl. And they were all ooing and aahing over this beautiful kintsugi repair. At which point the tea teacher came over and gave them a very hard time because she kept saying, look through the kintsugi to the bowl, 
look at the bowl. It is not about the kintsugi. It's about the finish, the whole thing. And I think that we, uh, there is a risk in the West that we are fetishizing <laughs> kintsugi beyond what it is. And uh, that sits uncomfortably with me. Yeah, and also because um, making kintsugi actually is um, not necessarily an easy process. Uh, we were <laughs> talking before before this conversation started that I have a, a broken bowl that I want to to have fixed, um, and I was talking with a, with a kintsugi shi uh, and potter here in London, um, who was sharing anecdotes how sometimes people want it to be immediate, and it's. <sighs> I remember she she once mentioned last year. Oh, great! Well, we'll we'll check it out next year because now it's too cold, right? Yeah. And temperature is important, humidity is important. You have to yeah. wait months, depending on the repair. So it's not something you do in a weekend. You stick it up, and then it's done, and you can use it and exhibit. You know, I mean, it is. It really is a craft. It's so um, there's so much knowledge in it. So when I was speaking to one makieshi who does kintsugi in Kyoto. And he was saying, you simply can't do it in May because it just won't work in May. And then we were speaking to another makie, she in Tokyo, Mitomura sensei. And he was saying that the different, uh, when the urushi or the lacquer is harvested makes a difference to the quality and how you deal with the different lacquer when you go to do the repair. So it is so, there's so much knowledge, both tacit and just, just, basic knowledge that has to be gained for the proper thing. And yes, it takes a long time. Each seam that's put together, the, the urushi needs to be cured. We call it drying. In fact, it, it takes moisture in order to cure. So it's, it's a bit of a misnomer to call it drying. But, and that, then you put on another layer of lacquer on top and that has to be cured. And that can take many days each time. So it's not unusual for a kintsugi repair bowl, depending on how many breaks there are in it, for it to take a year yeah. to be repaired. Yeah. And um, urushi, in a way, is like a, a, a leaving um, product, right? So you have to understand in what phase it is, You know, what are the conditions around it, feed it, the right conditions for it to happen. Well, it's a very um, organic material. It's uh, it's re it's refined, but it's not chemically changed. It's simply refined the sap from the tree. Right. Um, there's a question here that uh, that says, um, "Why is kintsugi only associated to pottery in Japan? Why didn't it make it as a concept to other crafts where the mender could repair an object yet leaving his um, an object yet leaving his or her trace?" It is used in other materials. It's, it, it is very often used for repairing lacquerware, for instance, but you can repair wood with it or glass or other things. It's just that it it's we associate it with repairing ceramics because of tea ceremony, hmm. because it's not only does it take a long, long time to do, not only are the materials very expensive to do it if you're using proper gold, but it's it takes a lot of skill to do it. So there's a huge investment in having something done. So of course, in the tea ceremony where these tea bowls became invaluable, that's where it really gave the undergirding for the commercial development of Kintsugi, you know, because these tea bowls, if they were broken or chipped or whatever, cracked, they had to be preserved because they were priceless. Mm -hmm. So you could invest that kind of Kintsugi repair in it. You most, you know, most of us wouldn't take an IKEA plate and do a proper kintsugi repair on it. It's a year and several hundred pounds. No, it's just not. You know. Uh, so. Speaking of objects, um, um, we can share a few images, and you can tell us the story behind it. Okay. But before that, I want to pick another question, um, which is: Could you provide some insight on kintsugi traditions in China? And you address. Uh, in the book, why it happened in Japan and maybe not in other places. So this, I think, is an interesting uh, thing to 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 discuss. Yeah, I, I I I say this rather gingerly because I I hate to make generalizations, but there is something I think. So whatever I say, take with a gra grain of salt here. Whatever I think within the Japanese aesthetic, especially the tea aesthetic, there is an acceptance of the imperfect. 
uh, Alex Kerr, who wrote several sort of amusing books about Japan and Kyoto, uh, said that uh, Japan has always had a haphazard aesthetic, you know, whereas China's aesthetic was much more about perfection mm. and much more classical. And so in Japan, they could accept things that were broken and still keep them as valuable objects. Whereas I've been told by other people who know about China, I know very little about China, that if there's a pot that's broken, it will be repaired, but it's often banished to the kitchen. Yeah. You know, that, that once it's no longer perfect, it's no longer used in the same way, you know, or it may only be used uh, like we repair, we've been repairing ceramics, of course, in the West for ages, but we may only use them for show afterwards. Yep. Whereas in Japan, it was about, there are three things about kintsugi that are important. One is it traditional kintsugi, it restores function. The other is that it can be very, very beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. And the third is th that it always has a story. There is no such thing as a kintsugi pot that doesn't have a story. Even if you don't know what that story is, the mind will conjure something up. And I think it also developed in Japan in, a, in this way because of the nature of the country. For example, it's earthquakes are a very common thing, are very particular to that, you know, to Japan geographically. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, Kintsugishi um, are always super busy after an earthquake because a lot of things break, uh, which is not a reality in other places. And also, um, this doesn't apply so much to Kintsugi because, as you mentioned, it, it can be very expensive. But yes, to other repair techniques that have um, developed in Japan that were associated with poverty. For example, yeah. these days we we look at boro, right? Uh, you know, the, the patchwork and stuff, and it looks cool and we want to have it and stuff, and actually it's quite expensive. But back then it was for farmers or people that couldn't afford clothes, uh, especially yeah. often the, the, the shagun or the upper classes brought a lot of their clothes and silks from China. And other people just had it to mend what they had uh, and now we see the aesthetic of it but back then it was almost i mean definitely not something to show off to to <laughs> others <laughs> yeah which by the way you debunk uh one of my favorite stories about kintsugi which un until i read your book i thought it was true uh which was um one of the ashikaga shaguns probably uh, uh yoshimasa yeah. um the story goes the um that he had one of his favorite Chinese bowls broken. Um, in his era, they loved everything from China, um, you know, especially regarding tea and art. Um, so he had it, he sent it back to China for it to be repaired. And they use another uh, common repair technique, which is using staples, right, to put things together. Mm -hmm. And when he received, received it back, he thought it was awful. So he gave it to someone. And that's where, according to this legend, Kintsugi was invented. But it's, um, it's a romantic idea, but I think it's, it's probably not true. Yeah, when, when I started working with Hiroko Roberts Taira uh, on the history of Kintsugi, she went to Japan with me on the Daiwa and uh, Sasakawa uh, grants that we got to do the research. And she, she very, very considerately turned to me and she said, you know, I think that story that you put in the T-Ball book isn't true, she said. <laughs> I mean, and the more we talked to people, the more it was evident. Because when you look at the bowl, it's called Bakohan. It's a beautiful bowl. And you can see the staples on it. And they look like locusts. And that's what the name Bakohan means. It means locusts. So there is no indication whatsoever that Ashikawa Yoshimasa actually thought it was ugly. Hmm. It was prized. That it's so prized that they gave it a name that marked the repair, that actually brought attention to the repair. So the, it just blew a hole in the story. And I think it's probably a Western romanticization, as you yep. say, a creation, a Western creation, because the story sounded good. What it does do is it gives us a date by which we know Kintsugi didn't exist before that, probably, because if it had, they would have had a Kintsugi repaired. And right. that was the 1400s. We think as closely as we can guess that Kintsugi probably came about around six, in the six, early 1600s. And um, we think that the first bowl, it, there is a good chance that the first Kintsugi tea bowl was actually a Koetsu bowl. I think I have a, the image of it. And the reason is because uh, Honame 
poets of both. He had, he was, he was a potter. He was in tea. He did tea. He was a tea master. It's the one on the left here. Uh, I've put this on the spread because I don't have permission to use this photo outside of the book. So, <laughs> so I think this is a way around it. This uh, crack that's been Kintsugi repaired was obviously a kiln crack. So it was, you know, obviously Kurtz made the bowl and it cracked in the kiln when he were taking it out. He then had either had it repaired or repaired it, but it, there's a good chance he repaired it himself because he had maquillé skills as well as everything else, as well as being a potter and a tea person and, and into gold because he was one of the people involved in the Rinpai, you know, the whole, that whole era of bringing so much gold into Japanese art. So, um, yeah, so we think that this is probably one of the earliest. There are a couple of questions um, that I think are connected. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna read two of them um, and then we can go into some of the stories uh, and the images uh, you, you shared with, with me. So uh, the first question <clears throat> is, how do you see Kintsugi man maintaining its craftsmanship in the future or even surviving the pace and possibility the new techniques we have in the modern society? And connected to this one, there's another question, which is, uh, what is the response in Japan and in the Chanayu world, particularly, to the blossoming of Kintsugi and particularly Kani Kintsugi in the West? I would hazard a guess that <clears throat> most Chajin or tea people don't have a lot of time for Kani Kintsugi. <laughs> uh, Kani Kintsugi can be very beautiful and it can be very well done, but the skill of proper Kintsugi, traditional Kintsugi, is very, very refined and very, very um, special. Mm. So why would you go for something cheap and fast to repair some object that is invested with so much of your own self in it? I mean, these objects, these objects, Kintsugi is about re repairing the irreplaceable. It's about repairing objects that you have such an intimate and personal connection to that you can't bear to lose it. You can't bear yeah, to lose it. Yeah, and tea ceremony, the bowls are almost a member of the family, right? They, they have a name, they have a role. You pick yes. them, not just yes. as a container, but for the right situation based on the seasons. So you wouldn't That's just right. do you know a repair just because. It's, yeah. it's to bring it back into the family in a way. Yeah, I, I want to go. The, the other thing that's rather odd in the West with how kintsugi is in the in the East, you don't see very much kintsugi in Japan. Uh, if you're in the tea room, you might see one kintsugi piece a year. It's you would never see more than one in a tea ceremony mm -hmm. used together because it it makes such a loud statement that it's you would not like showing off, right? Yes, it, well, not only that, but you wouldn't want the. Uh, the the conversation to be quite so you wouldn't want the two pieces to be yelling at each other. Plus we don't, in tea, we don't tend to use the same things. We tend to look for variety. So yeah, it, I think that Instagram, you were talking about Instagram, it has a lot to do in the West with Kintsugi because suddenly you can go and there are hundreds of pictures of Kintsugi things. Or if you just Google Kintsugi, you get hundreds of images of bowls that have been repaired, which in real life you would never see. It just wouldn't happen. So that's also contributed to its popularity for sure. And do you think that the more traditional side of Kintsugi and, and, and the craftsmanship that goes into it is at risk of survival, you know, with, with uh, our obsession with uh, uh, speed and just beauty and, and easiness? No, I don't. Because I think that that will happen, but that will be something different. Um, you know, lots and lots of people go to evening classes and make really, really lovely pots in learning how to do ceramics. And but they're not great ceramicists, but they may make beautiful pots and have some pieces. And that's absolutely fine. And we have a whole even if and even sort of some production potters, you may know potters who don't make the top rank of work, but they make beautiful work that you love using every day. I have some mugs that I use that aren't made by anybody famous, but I love those mugs. So there's room for all of it, but I don't think we'll ever lose the desire to have beautiful kintsugi done, 
beautiful, proper kintsugi done. Uh, I mean, this, speaking, your whole thing is called the craftsman. It's a this is about craftsmanship in that sense. Yes. Uh, and speaking of beauty, so let's share some of these photos because they are absolutely mm. beautiful. Um, mm. Yeah, Stephanie Hamill. This is an Australian potter, and she does her own kintsugi repairs, and she's doing more and more kintsugi repairs these days. These and she trained in Japan and in Australia in her kintsugi. And I think this bowl is just stunning with this. Now, this shows the different qualities. This is quite flat, this almost a, what's called togi dashi, which is the flattest makie technique. Um, some of them are raised more. The most common is called um, um, makie, she, ma, what is it called? I'm going blank here. It, it will come up, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, hiramakie, that's what I'm thinking. This, this one is hiramakie. This tiny little repair here is hiramakie. So it's raised just enough to have one layer of urushi and then the gold and then another layer of urushi. So just, you can just, if you run your finger over it or if you happen to put your lips on it, which you wouldn't do, um, you can feel it. So what that's the natural home for Kintsugi, by the way, that last mm. photo. And look at the quality of this one. This is Leticia Pineda in, in um, uh, France, and it was prepared by Catherine Nicholas. And she's also a French Kintsugi she. And look at how this is almost lumpy Kintsugi repair. And I actually think that adds to this piece. If this repair were very, very smooth, like Stephanie's was, it would take away from this beautiful surface that Leticia's created. And it might invites uh, someone to go and want to touch it and interact with it, not just have it as a as a museum object, right? That's just yeah. there to be looked at. Yeah. This one is is beautiful, and and at first sight, you don't see one of the most important features. Yeah. So talk us about that. Well, you can see on the right hand side that there are some cracks, and that's the the classical kintsugi repair. But if you look towards the left, you see some tiny flowers in gold. And what's happened there is there's been a piece missing. It's been filled in. Yeah, you can show. Been filled in with brown lacquer, urushi. And then the gold, then urushi has been painted on in designs and gold sprinkled onto it. So this is actually called makie naoshi, which means it was makie done by makie techniques. I mean, it's all makie techniques, but this is in particular decorative makie techniques. Now, interestingly, I, I was interviewing a, a kintsugi shi, well, makie shi in Kyoto, and he said he never saw this in Japan. He only ever saw this or heard about it when he came to England. <laughs> he saw the first piece at the Ashmolean, and he says he doesn't think it's a very Japanese aesthetic, mm. that it's too uh, busy. It fills in the empty space. And in Japan, empty space is a very important part of the aesthetic. So, yeah, but isn't that stunning? I think what is interesting is some of these techniques are very old and they started within a specific culture. But as they move forward, they also favor a positive contamination, the same way that, for example, ceramics came to Japan from China yeah. by, a, by a Korea, and then they developed their own style, which now we consider uniquely Japanese. Japanese, that's right. Uh, it's, it came from somewhere else, right? So I yeah. think that beyond the pure tradition of it, there's the evolution that comes with time and the intersection of different cultures, which is important. That's right, because people are constantly giving me trouble. Oh, they're uncomfortable with cultural appropriation. They say, how can you be doing so much in Japanese things? It's cultural appropriation. Well. It, I'm sorry, I, I just, uh, that's an argument I just can't see in this case. I think uh, the, the important aspect is, has to do with the respect, right? Yes, that's uh, right. Because actually this bowl looks more like um, um, a Korean Edo bowl in a way, inspired by those that were very simple. Uh, this is a very refined one. Yeah. The next one I want to show, it, it's a very exciting one. First of all, because the story behind it is funny, but also because it's, it comes with such um, history in, in, in the person who made it, which is this one. <laughs> yeah, this is called Nekawari Day, which means um, broken by the cat. Neko is cat. 
Um, I, when we were in Kyoto, we had arranged to go to the Raku Museum. Uh, I don't know if any of you, uh, most of you probably have heard of Raku. It's the, the, we're, we're now on the 16th dine, uh, level, this generation. This was the 15th, so this was a year, two years ago now. And um, we went to see this bowl, and I didn't think we were going to get to see it. But in fact, we we did. We were taken to a room upstairs, and suddenly this tiny, delicate woman came in, and she was carrying this bowl. And I knew what it was immediately because I'd read about this bowl. So the story is that Raku had finally developed this yakinuki technique, and this was the bowl that was the, the pivotal piece. This was the most important piece that he had made, and he kept it with him all the time in the studio. And they had this little terrier, a little dog of some sort, and the dog would stay with Raku, 15, all the time, Kichizaimon. And one day he went out to lunch and the door, Mrs. Raku was telling the story and she said, the door opened both ways. And then she went, pada, 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 pada. And as he went out, the door swung the other way and a cat came in off the street and went into the studio. And after lunch, when he went back, the cat was running rings around the the studio, there were scratches on the walls and everything. The dog was at the bottom, freaking out. And the cat jumped down, it hit the bowl, which fell onto the floor and broke. And apparently Raku looked at it and he turned around and he left the studio and he couldn't work for three days. In fact, it sounds like it was more severe than that. Um, now, normally a tea bowl that was broken like this would be ground up, it would be completely destroyed so that no one could reclaim it. And because it already had lost its life, as Mrs. Raku said. But she knew that this bowl was so important that she picked up the pieces and she saved them in a box. And then a year, it took her a year to decide, but she then took them to their makieshi to have them repaired. And then she gave it back to Raku. It took another year, over a year to have it repaired for it to be done. And you know that they rushed it because this was for Raku. <laughs> <laughs> so this was not, it wasn't that he was doing other work in the meantime. And apparently Raku was thrilled with it. And this actually is Ginsugi, right? So it was repaired Ginsugi. with silver, which uh, has one characteristic compared uh, to gold, yeah. which silver oxidizes when exposed yeah. to the air. So this started silvery in color and now it's it's a deep yeah. blue. And Mrs. Raku very uh, consciously chose silver because she said she wanted the the, the cracks and the silver to age with the bowl. And she said, now the silver and the bowl have joined together. They've become one. And that if it were gold, it would remain static and gold. It wouldn't change over time. So it, the other thing I have to say about this, which isn't in the book, is she said to us, this, this is getting old and the silver is getting thin now. And when it gets too thin, I'll just have it done again. Now, we tend to think we do a repair or something like that, and then it that's it. The piece is finished. Nothing else happens to it. But she's saying, well, you know, if it needs to be done again, we'll just do it again. So the pieces aren't frozen in time. They're actually part of the the life of the people who have who own them. The same way that a home, you know, can can last a long time, but it needs repairs, it needs mending. Yeah. Before before we jump into the next photo, there's a couple of questions that are connected um, also, um, which are, what are some oral traditions of the origin of kintsugi, followed by, what are some examples of kintsugi in Japanese literature, be it dynastic or modern literature? In oral tradition, it's not talked about as far as I could see. People don't pay much attention to kintsugi. It is in Japan. It isn't a thing. It, now it's becoming a thing. Now they're, we're paying attention to it. But um, no, it wasn't a thing. It was just a repair, which also happened to be loaded with metaphor. Mm. But it, it was just a repair. And in general, among this is this is a bit complex. In the, well, it's a bit contradictory. In general, there's something odd about breaking something in order to repair it. It's not a great idea. Uh, but then we have people like Oribe, who was one of the most famous tea people, tea men, who did exactly that. 
purportedly. We don't know for sure, but we're told that he broke things so that they could be repaired and then they'd be more valuable. So it's not it's not that it was never done, but there's something that doesn't sit comfortably, the idea of breaking something to repair it. Yeah, unless, is, unless that's part of what you're trying to say. Right, yeah, because you have a few examples of um, of Kintsugi used as part of an art project where yeah. it's part of a statement, and I'm going to show them in a second. But I think it was also Oribe who um, broke a bowl uh, to make it smaller. Yes, um, so it would true. fit better, right? True. So, yeah. So, so there was there was a goal in the breakage. It was not just you know to repair to make it look more beautiful, but to slightly change its function in a way or its interaction with with the user. Yes, he wanted it as a T bowl. Uh, it said, and it was too large for a T bowl. Mm. So he broke it into quarters and shaved them down and put them back together. Now that isn't technically kintsugi because he only used or only had urushi used red urushi. I doubt he did it himself. Mm. Um, Interestingly, because the it is in quarters, that means that there is a cross in the center of the bowl. And it's said that he did that intentionally because he was a secret Christian. But mm. there's a lot of controversy about that, whether he was or not. Um, another question is, could you tell us why culturally one should not put their lips over the kintsugi of the tea bowl? Oh, I mean, you could. There, it, Mm, it's just like when you're drinking, when you're in the tea ceremony and you're, you're served a bowl of tea, the front or the showman of the bowl is always served to you so that you are you see the front. But before you drink it, you always turn the front of the bowl away and you drink from the back of the bowl because you don't, it's more respectful and it's just the way it's done. And I think the same would be for Kintsugi. It would be unusual I, I don't know, no one's ever said this to me, but I would find it unusual to see someone drink where the repair is, um, mainly because it's it just doesn't feel quite right. I'm sorry, I can't articulate that. Oh, no, but, it's, yeah, but, but it does make a lot of sense. <laughs> it, it uh, just, it's just a feeling in the tea room, you just wouldn't do it. It's just... Uh, um, so so let's move back uh, to kintsugi as uh, an art form, not as a mm -hmm. technique for repair, but something that's used to express something that goes beyond just the the the, the repair work. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share a couple of images here. This is Paul Scott. So Paul's uh, famous for taking these 19th century blue and white wear, transfer wear, and erasing part of the design, you can see that he's left on this plate a little bit of the classic remains in the back. And then he superimposes a new decal on the front, new transfer on the front. But he's done a lot of this work using Kintsugi. So this plate either had a crack originally or he developed a crack in it. What he does is he often fires them again and that then will make them crack where there's a stress point. Uh, and I just think this is such a powerful piece. It just, and somehow it just wouldn't have the same strength if it didn't have that single lightning strike of Kintsugi down into the center of Aleppo, the city, showing how quickly a city can be destroyed. Um, I just think it's, it's very powerful. And he's used it very, very well, Kintsugi. And it's all easy Kintsugi in mm -hmm. this case, all faux Kintsugi. Yeah. Um, someone asks, does the philosophy get used in a more emotional-based relationship, uh, not product, uh, respect of scars and breakages? And I think in this case, um, it's 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 used in that way, right? It's showing the destruction of the city of Aleppo. Um, there's a bomber there flying, there's rubble in the front, but also there's a repair, right? That has brought yeah, yeah. the pieces that's together. Right. Yeah, that's right. I think that's right. And and of course, Kintsugi is used, I don't know if this is what your questioner was getting at, but Kintsugi is also used simply as a metaphor without any object. So it's often, for instance, used by Down syndrome groups, uh, self-help groups, uh, as a way of uh, accepting imperfection and being inclusive. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, yeah. Could be very powerful that way too. So I had an interview with um, Tom Shakespeare, who's the disability advocate, and uh, he was saying how Kintsugi just fits 
in the in the world of disability so closely, you know, as a as a metaphor. This is another example where Kintsugi yeah. is used to transmit a message that's not about the repairs per se, right? Yeah, yeah. This is Claudia Clare. She's done a, all of her work is based on her feminist principles, and this piece she's done a lot of work in in the Middle East, and um, this is remembering Adifa. So she was uh, this. Adifa was a young woman who at 16, I think, am I remembering this story, the details right, I think, was hanged for adultery and lewd behavior or something. And this was because she had been repeatedly raped by a married man uh, who was a taxi driver in her village. So to tell this story, what Claudia did was she built this piece, which is quite large, actually, it's probably three or four feet tall. And she then took it for a ceremony outside the Iranian embassy where it was ceremoniously broken. So they smashed it. She then took the pieces back to the studio and reconstructed them and put these flowers, flower imagery and things on them. And if you show the next image, you can see that on the inside, she put a picture of Adfa. And I think that this is a really powerful one because often we tend to think of Kintsugi as making something whole again, but we can't, Kintsugi can't fix anything. It only makes you accept what's broken and may make the break more beautiful and things, but it, it doesn't actually fix anything. You couldn't bring this girl back to life after she'd been executed. Mm -hmm. But Kintsugi certainly expresses her story. This is another one where uh, we see a product that, um, actually this one broke in the kiln, right? So it was never a, a whole uh, a whole yeah. pot. It came it's, out broken. And kiln, kiln, uh, kiln damage is often Kintsugi repaired. That's, that's common. So this is John on the right. When he was 18, he built his first Anagama, which is a huge Japanese kiln. It was seven meters by two meters tall or something. He filled it with these beautiful pots, opened it up after five days of firing and eight days of cooling, reached in, put his hand on the first rim of the pot, went to lift it, and it fell to pieces. And what had happened was that the, the glaze had the, the front of the kiln was hot. It was too, the firing was uneven. Front of the kiln was very hot. The glaze had run off the pots and onto the shelf. It stuck. When the when ceramics cool in the kiln, they actually contract at a certain point, about 10% or more, very suddenly. And at that point, it couldn't move on the shelf. So it cracked internally. So they look intact, but every one of them was broken. But because he had spent an entire summer building this kiln with his wonderful grandfather, who's there behind, mm. uh, on the, his grandfather or the family vineyards, uh, he decided in the end to Kintsugi repair it. And there's one of them in the front. And that's his wife behind. Because when, when he first sent me this photo, when John said it to me, I said to him, that's a lovely photo, but I really can't put it in the book because people won't look at the pot. All they'll think of is, God, your grandfather has a, a very young and beautiful wife. And he said, no, that's my wife. <laughs> so so um, yeah, it was a lovely story, I thought. Um, I'm mindful of the time. So I want to share a couple more short stories and maybe pick one or, or two more questions. Um, so this is actually a bowl you made originally. Yes. The only tea bowl I ever made. I went into ceramics to make teaware and then never did. I, I make sculptural work. Uh, I make work to engage the body sense of touch. So I made this bowl in 1992 and Raku fired it with some friends uh, and at our house. And at the end of the day, I gave it to my friend, Alex Fraser. And Alex took it to Japan for his tea studies. He was there for three years study, studying tea ceremony. And when he came back, the bowl was broken in transit. And so when I started to, now I've known, I'd known Alex since 1981 when I came to England from Japan. And when I started 
to work on this book, I was talking to Alex and he said, well, remember that bowl, which I hadn't remembered this bowl. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I have that bowl still. And I said, well, let me have it Kintsugi repaired. So I did. And it, they started, uh, it was Ronald Pyle who did the repair and he started the repair the week that I started actually writing the book, you know, continuing research, but actually writing it. And it was finished the week that I sent it off to the publisher. So sadly, it's become a Kasugi story in and of itself because this time last year, Alex died of COVID. Hmm. So um, it's become a particularly special role because of that. And and you mentioned this earlier that even if you don't know it, someone doesn't know about this, each Kintsugi ball has a story, mm. right? And and I find that that's a beautiful thing uh, because it's a vehicle for stories. I think that as uh, as a race, you know, humans are storytellers, yes. uh, but it's not just the oral stories or the written stories. It's also the material history, which sometimes is the challenge that we face. Uh, you know, with with digital, right? Yeah. You can have this ball around in probably a few centuries, and people might or might not know the stories, but they could imagine some of the stories that went into this one. Um, but there are other objects which are more transient and don't li leave a trace. Which I think one of the things I'm interested in, uh, you know, regarding craftsmanship is the stories, the human stories that transcend uh, a moment in time because of the physicality of it or how it interacts with our senses. And Kintsugi yeah. is both a very sense-driven but also very sensual um, craft. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in talking about the stories and once the stories are forgotten, I think we also lay our own stories onto objects. So, you know, someone 200 years from now uh, may find this bowl and not know anything about it, but they it might strike a chord for them in their own history, their own story. Definitely. Um, someone asks, do you think part of the rise of Kintsugi is the return to using authentic ceramic places at home as a way to depart from the IKEA um, Asian of our homes? Uh, Yes, in that it gives us, uh, Kintsugi comes out of an appreciation of handmade things and well-made things. Mm. Um, I think that we're never going to get way, away from Ikea plates. Uh, that's going to continue to be in our lives, that level of ceramics. We're not all going to always use a, a 55 pound mug for our tea every morning when we're half asleep or hungover. Yeah. You know, it's it's... I think there are different layers, but I think that one of the things that's going to happen is that we will continue to develop an appreciation for handmade and ha well-made things. Yeah, and an important point regarding that, um, I was having this conversation with uh, Nicole Roumanier from uh, Sysjack, and, and she was a curator of the British Museum, uh, about the risk, you know, a few of these techniques could disappear, yeah. And I was asking her, what's the best way to, you know, keep them alive? And she was saying, using these objects, have your porridge, you know, on, on a bowl and stuff, because sometimes we think too much about the price or the cost, but, you know, some of these objects have been around for a long time. And by bringing them back into our life, it's about the quality, not the quantity. We, yeah. we are directly supporting those that make these things, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, 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 I feel that there are levels of use. So I don't. I have a, my great grandmother's Limoges china, and um, I I use it. I wouldn't have it if I didn't use it. But I only use it once a year. But that's all right mm. for me. That's special. That's all right. I don't have to use it every day. I don't yep. feel I do, or even every week. You know. So you can have these things and as long as they are part of your life in some sense, we're giving value to them and we're keeping them alive. And yeah, we need to hire people, buy more stuff that's made beautifully or have things that we are special repaired. Yeah. Because the book comes out next week. Yes. In I the UK. Thursday in the UK, yeah. Fantastic. Now, Bonnie, um, 
It's it's been fascinating. I knew about Kintsugi. Um, I uh, I've been curious about it, but what your book opened to me was part of the background, the historical background, and and where it came from, how it evolved, but also a bit where it's going, how it's evolving, how different techniques have um, helped Kintsugi become more accessible to others, while also preserving the the respect for the tradition part of it. Um, was there I'm sure there was, but what was the, the biggest surprise or takeaway that you took from this book that you uh, that surprised you or that you were not expecting when you embarked into into you know the trip of writing a book? I it's very personal, but then that's what it is: is the fact that I became so immersed. I just felt like I had immersed myself in this technique. It just felt so right, like I had found this metaphor that worked for me. And how and I I I firmly believe that a good metaphor is a real metaphor. It's transformative. And if you accept the metaphor, the visual metaphor even, you don't have to articulate it, you don't have to talk about it. You just take that bowl and you see that bowl and you feel that repair and it just does something to you emotionally. And I think to me, that was the biggest surprise. I didn't expect that. I mean, I knew I loved it. I knew it was beautiful. You know, I just didn't expect it to to affect me so much on an emotional level. Well, Bonnie, with that, uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for um, dedicating time to, to this conversation. Oh, thank you. Um, I see the comments on the chat. People love the stories, the Nikawari, the one. There's a lot of thanks there. So. Thank you. I do encourage people to to check out the book. Um, um, it's it's not only interesting from a, a you know the the research that goes into it and well even the practicalities, but the photography is amazing uh, because it's true that online you can find a lot of photos, but not the right photos often. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this book is also a, oh this is kintsugi and this is how it can manifest itself and it brings a lot of the beauty and, and, and the rituals behind it. So thank you very much for, for putting the effort into making a book, which I know is not necessarily a, a, an easy one. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me, John. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about it. And I'm looking forward to eventually when, when things will come down to, to yeah. visit you in, in uh, Cambridge and, and have yes. a proper bowl of matcha together. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. So and well, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you.